sing that out one more time.
Aren't you glad that we serve a risen God? Amen. That wasn't loud enough. Aren't you glad that we serve a risen God? Amen. That means that there's hope for you today. No matter how small or how insignificant you feel or how big your problems seem to be or whatever you're dealing with today, there is hope because we serve a risen God, a God that resurrects stories, a God that resurrects dreams, that resurrects hope, that resurrects marriages, that resurrects finances, that resurrects depression, that resurrects anxiety, that resurrects what got stolen away from you. We serve a God who is enough. Amen? God is enough for you. God is enough for you. He is enough. Let's say that together. He is enough. Lord Jesus, we worship you today. That's why we gather together. Father, we gather together to worship you. We gather together, Lord, to be encouraged, Father, and supported today. Father, there are so many of us that come in here today, and we have had a busy week. We have had a a stressful week, and we barely got here this morning. We just barely drug in today. And we've been walking with the Lord a long time, and we barely drug in here. And there's some that haven't been walking with God maybe at all, and they drug in here. We all just kind of came in here this morning. Father, we're here not by accident. It is by divine appointment today. And so, Lord, I ask today that your spirit would be here, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would speak life into everyone that's here this morning. Fill hearts with hope. Fill minds, Lord, with your spirit. Fear this, fill this place, Lord, and each one of us, Lord, today with your presence. Lord, we lift up the services here today and those that are in Columbus today, those that will be watching online today and maybe later this week, other churches, Lord, that proclaim your message today locally and all over the world. Father, would the the gates of hell, Father, not stand against what you want to say today. We love you, and we thank you, Lord, that while we're not enough, or someone else is not enough, Father, you are enough. And that's why, Lord, we sing hallelujah. We give you praise in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. We are beyond excited today for the first time to be one church in two locations. And we celebrate that. We want to welcome in this morning our Columbus Family Connecting Point Church. We are glad that you're here today. We want to welcome you that are here in Pittsburgh this morning. Welcome those that are watching online. We are starting a new series that has the same name as the church in Columbus does called Connecting Point because relationships matter. Because relationships matter. Say that with me. Because relationships matter. See, this series is about we all have these connecting points in our life that change our life for the better. There's certain connecting points we have in life. We have some negative connecting points that can change our life forever, but we have some connecting points in our life that change our life for the better, and it makes me think about one specific connecting point that changed my life forever. I went to college in Kansas City at a place called Mid-America Nazarene University. And while I was there, there was this 
uh, freshman transfer orientation that I was invited to along with other freshmen and transfer students. And they had just different things that you did all week long. And then at the end of the week, they had this kind of a day of fun where you could do different things. And one of the things that they did was this yuck wrestling deal. And so different people who were part of this week would get involved in that and, you know, and wrestle. And all of a sudden there's this group behind me and I hear this sweet, cute, little blonde, curly headed voice from behind me who said something like, you know, I would never do that or, or that's gross. And uh, I remember just turning around in this light, literally people tease me about this, but seriously, there was like this light that kind of came down and, and I heard this music. I don't know if anybody else heard it, but it was like, woo, dream weaver, I believe you can get me through the night. And I'm like, hey, did, did you guys hear that? And uh, No, no, we didn't. We didn't hear that. Also, you can't sing very well. And I'm like, thinking of some, say something cool, right? Like, how you doing? <laughs> Sup? But all that came to me was, uh, 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 yeah, yeah, it's, I don't know if I would do it either. I don't even really know if I talked to her anymore that day, but I do know that a couple months later, I called her, got her number from somebody, and asked her out, and obviously the rest is history. And I think back on that little bitty exchange, that connecting point between the two of us, that changed the course of my life. And it's not just, you know, my little story. We all have these connecting points in our life that change the course of our life for the better. The first time you saw your child being born, or the first time that you met a teacher or a coach or somebody who believed in you, maybe when no one else had. I mean, you could think of lots of different relationships that take place. A friendship, someone for the first time that finally understood you, someone who, who believed in you, who supported you, and that connecting point changed the course of your life. It's not just us today. Throughout Scripture, it's been that way. And over 2,000 years ago, it was that way for this paralyzed man. There was this paralyzed man in Mark chapter 2, if you have your Bibles and you want to go there. If not, you can just uh, read along with me on the screen. But there was this paralyzed man who had been paralyzed. Scripture doesn't say for how long. We don't know exactly what had caused his paralysis, whether he was born that way or if it just had happened, you know, through some kind of tragedy. But what we do know is that at some point in his life, he became paralyzed and what normal people would use a mat for, like sleeping or just, you know, resting, this was this man's life, his house, where he lived, where he saw life from. As other people would pass him by, as other people would, would walk by and go about their busy days, his life was his mat. And, you know, you can imagine it wouldn't take very long for someone who had that type of a lifestyle. We all maybe know people like that today, that that can be discouraging and, 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 you know, put us in a bad spot. And that was where this man was. Kind of like some of us can be, not necessarily physically paralyzed, but paralyzed by depression or anxiety or financial struggles or failed marriages or worry worrying about our adult kids, worrying about our kids that have not yet grown, worrying about our spouse. I mean, different things that we could fill the blank in, right? That become our mat. And this man's mat was his legs, was his paralysis. And at some point, he hears that Jesus is in town. I mean, this guy, Jesus, who had been you know, healing people and had been doing all these different signs and wonders and people in town just, you know, were gathering to, to hear this man speak. He was actually going to be at some local person's house in town and, and people are making their way there. But I mean, obviously he can't go because he can't move. So there again, he's reminded of his paralysis. Four men who are in town actually hear about Jesus being at this place that, where he's teaching and preaching, and they decide they're going to go. And on their way, they pass by this guy on a mat, probably 
like a lot of people had done that day. But for whatever reason, they decided that they were going to stop and not only stop, but bring this guy to Jesus. And so that's what they began to do. They took this guy, they began to carry this guy on his mat to Jesus. That's the first connecting point you kind of see in this story is this man's life starts one way and all of a sudden at that same day his life has changed because his position has changed. He's now being carried to Jesus because he can't get there by himself. The Bible doesn't say how long he's being carried. It's just that he's carried. And at some point they reach the house where Jesus is teaching. It's filled with religious leaders from all over the region. It's filled with local people who hear that Jesus is in town and just want to see the show. They don't know who he is. They just want to see the show. And so as the four men arrive at this place where Jesus is at, it's completely packed. I mean, so packed that there's people outside the door, Scripture says. It makes me think of my in-law's Christmas, my, especially my father-in-law's family's Christmas. I mean, it is so packed in that house that they need to have the air conditioning on in December. It is just like so stinking hot in there. Too many people. That's what this is like. And you would think that as the men arrived at this house and realized there's no way we're going to get these, this guy through, that they would just say, well, we tried. I mean, we did more than what most people do. We tried. And so they get to the door. They realize that they can't get him through to Jesus. Instead of giving up, they decide that they're going to be resolved about this because they really believe God could do something about this. And so they persevere and they decide instead of using the door, we'll try the fire escape. So they go up the side of the house, go on top of the roof. They don't even know who this guy's house is, but they say, hey, let's just dig a hole in this guy's roof. Now, I don't know if I would be as kind and patient if somebody got on top of my house and took an axe to my roof. But they dug a hole in the roof, and Scripture says that they lowered this man right in front of Jesus. I mean, think of this risk. There's all these community leaders there. There's all these religious people there. There's all these people that they know there. And their faith is so big that they lower him in front of Jesus. What's Jesus going to do? Is he going to say, you're interrupting me? What are you doing? But scripture says that he's in seeing their faith in realizing what these men had done, that Jesus looks at the paralyzed man. Seeing the faith of these four men, Jesus looks at the paralyzed man and says, My child, your sins are forgiven. Can we say that together? My child, your sins are forgiven. Then Jesus, at some point, turns to the paralyzed man after some dialogue with the religious leaders. And he turns to him and he says, Stand up. Take up your mat that you've been living on, that you've been seeing life through. Pick it up and go home. Stand up, pick up, and go home. Let's say that together in both locations. Stand up, pick up, and go home. The man doesn't waste any time. He's got a new set of wheels. He says, all right. He jumps up grabs his mat, and he walks right through the crowd of people that are just stunned. Just absolutely stunned. And Scripture says that all of those people are now praising God because of what they've just seen. In fact, not only are they praising God, but they say, we've never seen anything like this before. This morning, as we think about this story, there's a lot of things that not only we could grab from this story, but also could help us in our life because no matter how long you've been going to church, whether you've been in in church since you were born or this is the first time that you've been in church, we have all have things in our life, as I mentioned earlier, earlier, that can keep us down. And if we look today at some of the patterns from this story and apply them to our life, they can make a difference in our life. You know, sometimes the truth and the things that we need are right under our nose. 
and we don't even realize it. Have you ever thought, seen somebody before, obviously you have, and, and we all have, where you look at them and you're like, the answer to your problem is so right in front of you. I mean, you're looking all over for these answers, and it's right in front of you. This morning today, I believe for somebody, the answer that you need today is in, the, in this simple story. First takeaway that we can grab from this story today is that sometimes in our life, we think that our story isn't going to change. And just because the mat has been your story doesn't mean it has to continue to be your story. Just because the mat has been your story doesn't mean it has to continue to be your story. I need somebody to say amen. Amen. Just because whatever your mat is, has been your story. We serve a resurrected God who can change your story. As I've shared many times, you know, I was not a person of character and integrity when I was growing up. My mat was dishonesty, and God changed my life. See, just because lying had been my story didn't mean that it had to continue to be my story when I connected myself with God's story. Amen? Amen. Another thing that I think it's important for us to realize today is that sometimes we're able to pick up our mat and go home, not because we desire it, not because we believe that it can happen, but because someone else believes that it can happen. See, sometimes getting off the mat happens because someone else refuses to quit on you. Can I get an amen? Amen. Folks, today, and I know I'm not the only one, but I can just testify to me, and I'll never stop testifying to this. I'm not in a bar today, or I'm not somewhere, you know, depressed or, or full of worry and doubt today or struggling in some massive way because of the prayers of other people, not because of me. I had people in my life that believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. I had people on their face praying for me when I was not even praying at all. And folks, today, I don't know, but I personally believe this man that was on this mat didn't believe that his life was going to be any different that day, but some men did. There were some people that believed this man's paralysis was going to end that day, not because they believed it or because he believed it, but because someone else believed it. And folks, every one of us today have some people in our life, whether it's sin or, or cancer or relationship issues or whatever it might be, who are in a place where they, their mind is, is just hopeless. And our interceding on their behalf can change their story. These men... They refuse to quit when they get to the door and it's full. And they said, if the door ain't going to work, then we'll use the roof. So they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Talk about resilience. I'm trying to think what it would take if someone was trying to get me to Jesus. They had to carry me up a ladder and put me on a roof and put a hole in someone's roof and and lower me down. That's an ugly picture. Folks, we serve a God who resurrects and brings hope to the place that we're willing to dig a hole and lower people down before Jesus. And I believe figuratively in my life that people carried me up a roof and lowered me down to Jesus and said, would you reach him? And there are people in your life, whether you ever get to know it or not, that have done the same thing for you. And there's people that whether they know it or not, you have done the same thing for them. 
See, there are some mats in life that we can't get up from alone. Let's read that together. Some mats in life we can't get up from alone. And you want to know sometimes what keeps us on the mat is believing that we can solve our problem ourselves. Satan wants us to believe that we have the answers, that we can figure this out on our own, that our drinking problem is not anybody else's problem, our gambling problem is not anyone else's problem, our struggle with something in life, whatever it is, is nobody else's problem. Nobody else has this problem. Nobody else would, would want to care for me with this problem. They would think less of me with this problem, so I keep it to myself, and yet Scripture tells us, and we we see it play out time and time again that there is freedom in, in asking for help or just taking the help when someone offers it to you. We've all heard the story about the guy on the side of the mountain who prays for help and then dies and goes to heaven and says, God, why didn't you send me help? And God says, I sent you a climber and a plane and a helicopter, and you kept saying you're waiting on me to help you. That's okay. Folks, the way that God helps us sometimes is by someone else helping us off the mat. Sometimes God comes in the form of a friend. Sometimes God comes to us in the form of a parent or a child or a coworker or someone But the doorway to God, or more importantly, the roof to God, doesn't happen through pride. It happens through humility. I don't know what it would be like to be carried in front of people I know. But these four men carried this paralyzed on a mat, carried, carried this paralyzed man on a mat. What's also interesting in this story is when they carry this man, to, this paralyzed man to Jesus, all of us would think that what God's going to heal is his legs. But you know, sometimes what we think we need isn't what God thinks we need, at least first. See, how we prioritize our mats is not always how God prioritizes our mats. How we prioritize our mats. Jesus, give me new legs. Jesus, give them new legs. Jesus, fix my finances. Jesus, fix my husband. Jesus, fix my wife. Jesus, fix my kids. Fix my boss. That's what I need. But what's interesting, if you caught this when I was telling this story earlier, the scripture here that we read, it doesn't say, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, get up and walk. That happened later. The first thing that we see in this story is the faith of these men caused Jesus to forgive this man's sins, not heal his legs. Could it be that God is more concerned with the unseen? That God is more concerned with the spiritual than He is the seen or the physical world? See, God prioritizes the eternal over the temporal every time. That creates some tension for us because probably what's on our hearts and our minds a lot of the time may not be the spiritual, it may be the physical. I don't mean actual physical legs, but physical something in our life that's tangible. And the creator of the universe has an opportunity to heal this man's legs and he waits. And he models to the religious leaders And to the four men, and to the paralyzed man, most importantly, that his biggest mat, his biggest issue is not the physical. 
It's the spiritual. Paul learned this the hard way, but he got it. And eventually he started these churches all over, and one of the churches was Corinth. And his second letter to Corinth, the church in Corinth, he says, they must have forgotten this too. He says, so don't look at the troubles that we can see now. Can I tell you that if you've lived any life at all, we all have troubles. And as we, as we walk in life, those troubles change. But we all have troubles. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Let's just read the first half of that. So we don't look at the troubles we see now. Well, then what are we supposed to look at? Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. Now check this out. I mean, I'm just being, I'm being real with you today. I miss my grandpa. And no matter how much I fix my gaze on Jesus, grandpa's not just going to rise up out of the grave and knock on my door and say, let's have coffee. Some of us miss some type of a relationship, and God could heal it, but a lot of times that never gets resolved. Some people wanted an apology, or you wanted to say an apology, and they're not around anymore. And no matter how much you fix your gaze on Jesus, they ain't going to come over, they ain't going to call, they ain't going to text. And yet, he says, fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. He goes on, for the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. But the things we cannot see will last forever. Say it with me. But the things we cannot see will last forever. Could it be that some of the reason, this is good, this is not in my notes, Could it be that some of the reason that we're paralyzed on the mat is because our priority, our priorities of healing are different than God's priorities of healing? We want the problem or the situation to go away, and God says, in due time, but right now, I care about your soul and your mindset. The other thing that we see from this story is We're all this paralyzed man, aren't we, in some way? And once God forgives us of our sin, one of the things that happens is we expect then now that we're saved or we've got a relationship with God, we expect the church to grow us spiritually. We expect a small group to grow us spiritually. And we sometimes, we rate, you know, how things are going in our life and whether the mat is still present or not based on our attendance or someone else's church attendance or if we've read our Bible enough or, or we've done all of these things. And, and then we kind of measure maturity that way. But you want to know really how you grow in Christ? It's not through a Sunday school class, although We encourage you to go. It's not necessarily through a small group class, although we want you to go. It's when we start to have a heart for the paralyzed man and begin to realize that we were paralyzed and we start to move from the person who was carried to the one who carries. That's when discipleship happens. That's when growth happens. That's when God is moving in us. See, God's long-term plan for you and for me is to move from the carried to the one who carries. When we stand before God, He's not going to evaluate church attendance or how well you know the Bible. Did you live out the Bible? Did you carry people or did you just value carrying people. But folks, before we can carry others, we have to believe in faith that Jesus carried for us. 
See, I can't offer something that I don't have. I can't carry you somewhere that I haven't been. I can't testify to something that I have not experienced in my own life. Jesus carried for us so that we could carry for others. But no matter what our story is, because we all have a unique story, I don't like it when people say, I know how you feel. Oh, you went through a divorce? Well, so did I. I know how you feel. No, you don't. You don't know how someone feels. You might have been through a situation that's in the same ballpark, but you ain't me and I ain't you and you haven't been through my story and my kids aren't your kids and your kids aren't my kids. We all have unique stories. Don't ever tell somebody, I know what you're going through. You can say, I'm praying for you. I feel the story you're telling me, but I don't know your exact situation. But we all have one situation in common because no matter what our mats are, we all have one specific mat in common. And you know, we have these, I do it too, we have these pictures on Facebook and Instagram of of our new baby or our new grandchild or our new niece and nephew or someone we care about. And you know, as cute and cuddly and innocent as that baby is, that baby also has the same mat in common as the person who's 50 years old who's carrying around the same mat that they never got rid of when they were little. And that mat is called sin. And sin is this inherent condition that we are all born with, that we are bent in some way towards selfishness. I've met people who are atheists that are more caring than some Christians are, but yet all of us, no matter how caring or uncaring we are, all of us, when we're born, are bent towards ourself. And it's called carnality, carnal nature. It's called, I want my way. It's like Subway. Have it your way. Or Elvis's song, I did it my way. And, it's, it, and it, it robs us of what God wants for us. But folks, Paul writes to Rome, he says, for the wages of sin is death. You think of a wage, it's what you're paid. The wages, their payment. The wages of sin is death. Say that with me. The wages of sin is is death, but that little word that I just said makes all the difference in the world, but the free gift of God, it wasn't free to Jesus, but it's free to us, the free gift of God, the free gift of God is eternal life. How? Only one way. My mom lived in Key West, Florida for a few years, and I went and saw her, and there's one road into Key West and one road out. There's not more than one road. The only way to peace with God and peace in eternal life is through Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus says. No one comes to me but through the the Father, through Jesus Paul says earlier in that same letter, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. If you're sharing your testimony with someone, look up Romans 3 and Romans 6. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for who? For everyone. For the victim and the perpetrator for everyone who believes no matter who we are for everyone has sinned we're all we all fall short we're all guilty for everyone has sinned and falls short of God's 
glorious standard. There's nothing you've done or nothing you could do to earn God's love. It's a gift. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. Here's the one point we have today. It's really hard, so you'll have to think on it. You ready? When we connect with God, connect is the name of the series, so that's why I use the word, but really connect isn't even strong enough. When we surrender and give our lives to God, He changes our story. He gives us a desire to help the person or the people on the mat. When we connect with God, He changes our story. Say that with me. When we connect with God, He changes our story. So here's the one thing that I would ask all of us today, no matter how long you've been in the church or how new you are today, in both locations, would you consider making the connection with Jesus today? Folks, when we make that connection with Jesus, he changes our story. This morning... I encourage us just to bow our heads and close our eyes. Whether you're watching online, you're in Columbus, you're here today, would you just bow your heads and close your eyes? And I just want to ask you this morning, what is the mat in your life? If you don't have a relationship with him, obviously the mat is not having a relationship with God. But even those that would say, you know what, I feel like, I feel like things are good between me and God. We still have a tendency to have a mat. What's the mat in your story? What would happen today if you gave that mat back to Jesus? If you just simply said to him, Lord, here's my mat. So with your head bowed and eyes closed, just tell God what your mat is. No matter how big you think your mat is, other people got one that's bigger, bigger. God, here's my mat. Here's what it is. And what if today you just simply said, God, I give you my mat today, whatever that is. If you're not a believer, just simply say, God, my mat is my sin, and I invite you to come into my life and forgive me of my sin. I believe that you shed your blood and died on a cross and was resurrected from the grave. I invite you to come into my life and replace the emptiness that I have with your peace and your mercy and your grace. I receive salvation today because it's free, not because I necessarily feel some emotional pull, but because your word tells us. I receive your salvation today. You take my sin, I receive your salvation. And for others of us today, maybe it's not salvation, it's something else. And you say, God, I just give you this mat and I take your freedom and your grace and your presence and your power today in Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed, whether you're in Columbus, you're watching online or you're here, if you prayed that prayer or something like that, would you just slip your hand up really quick? We're not going to embarrass you. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, you see those hands. More importantly, Lord, you see those hearts. Father, you see, Lord, into our souls. Father, I thank you right now for those people who've, who've given their life to you, who've asked you into their heart, who've surrendered their mats, Lord, whatever that looks like. So now I pray against Satan today. I pray that he wouldn't snatch those mats. But Father, we would have faith believing today. I also pray today, Lord, if there's someone who the mat is just complacency and you're calling them to go and make a difference in someone's life, 
I pray that you give them the strength to do that. We love you and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Let's stand together this morning.
Sure.